Good morning. I'm Lisa Spackapan. I'm reading the scripture today. It's not a psalm. Uh, the bulletin says it is. It's Matthew 3, 13. Um, the first scripture reading for our What's Your Why worship series is from the third chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. In this series, several of our church staff and our members will reflect on why they seek to live as Christians in the world today, and then why they do this thing called church. This first passage is about the why of Jesus himself. So, from the third chapter of Matthew. Then Jesus, coming from Galilee, arrived at the river Jordan to be baptized by John. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let me pass through now, for we need in this way to fulfill every just requirement. Then John let him pass. And having been baptized, Jesus immediately rose up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and Jesus saw God's Spirit descending as a dove, alighting upon him. And behold, there was a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I delight. Thanks be to God for these words of life. A couple of notes before I get started on my sermon proper. First of all, I want to add my welcome to all of you to, who are here today, whether you are with us in person or online. We are very glad that you're part of this community of faith here today. However it is, however it is God has drawn you to be here, whether it's by the force of habit or to, whoops, say goodbye to John, you know, right over there on the other side of that divider. Um, or uh, you're new to town and giving various places a try, whatever it is, um, whether this is your 10,000th time here, we are very glad that God has drawn you to be part of this worshiping community today. Um, secondly, I want to draw attention to the cover of your worship order now, I know that sometimes it's difficult to see the connection between the sermon and the, uh, sometimes even the scripture reading, but certainly the cover of the worship order. But uh, what Grant was going for here was um, something that actually is reflected in my sermon. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, countercultural. And so just as a little preview, I want you to note that there's this giant well, in Hinsdale, I guess this is about a $15 million house. Elsewhere in the world, maybe only a $2 million house. Um, but there is a giant disconnect between that giant house back there, looking beautiful with the uplighting. You all love your uplighting. And, um, and what's going on at the water's edge here? Uh, that's some sort of baptism taking place, apparently. And what's going on here is somehow different than what's going on here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, thirdly, I want to mention that uh, as part of this What's Your Why series, we're going to be trying to get people to engage even more with our social media. And so if you uh, are on Facebook, go to the church Facebook page and see the entries about the What's Our Why series. If you're on Instagram, go like the Instagram post and answer the questions. We have like interactive questions on our social media. Um, um, that relate to this series. So take a look there, and the more you engage as our church members, the more likely others are to engage with the life of our congregation as well. So please, uh, so please do that as part of this What's Your Why series. And with that, let us pray. Most gracious God, thank you so much again for the fact that we have gathered together in your name today. However it is you have drawn us here, we give you thanks and we pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts, make this time a nourishment to our souls together. We pray that as we all begin to think about our why, that you will be 
in that question, that you will be in that exploration, that you will be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To quote my son at age five, why? To quote my daughter at age five, why? To quote my nieces and nephews at age five, why? To quote just about every five-year-old at any time in any place, I believe, why? Today we are beginning a series of sermons and messages about the favorite question of nearly every five-year-old everywhere. To state the obvious, five-year-olds ask why about so many things, not just because they want to irritate you, but because they are trying to figure out who they are, how the world works, and what their place in the world is. In this series, we are asking, what's your why? Because the task of figuring out who you are, how the world works, and what your place in the world is, is important all through our lives not just when we are five. We are being a little more discriminating um, or at least a little more focused than a five-year-old uh, here in our series though. Although we are going to have several people from our staff and several church members speak to their own why, the goal of all of this really is to have you explore your why? Specifically, why do you do this thing called church? Why are you, in some way, a follower of Jesus, the one we call Emmanuel, God with us? What's your why? This is particularly important in our days because things are changing. I am leaving, I am leaving today to attend a three-day conference or really more of a gathering, a conversation among the senior pastors of the largest churches in the United Church of Christ. And I guarantee you that directly or indirectly, the main topic of conversation among us is going to be, what's going on? What does a post-pandemic church look like? What does a faithful church look like when so many in our society, even former members, now perceive the church to be irrelevant to their lives, or even worse, a bludgeon rather than a balm. What is faith today when faith no longer makes you fit in, but rather makes you more awkward? That's really what's behind all the conversations we'll be having. At the heart of all of those questions that we senior pastors will be talking about is the assumption that things are changing. Now, I actually try not to play the change card too often. You know, I guess preachers, maybe more than others, but everyone seems to overuse that word today. I mean, the world is always changing. How to live a life of faith is always changing. The relationship between the church and society is always changing. Life is always changing, if for no other reason than because we're all one day older than we were yesterday. But the pace of change is not always the same. And this is a time when the pace of change is dramatic. Never a sure thing, the road ahead is more unclear than ever. 
And in such a time, it is good to learn the wisdom of five-year-olds everywhere and ask, why? Not why are things changing, not just why they're changing, but the more basic personal question, why do I do this? What's my why? Now, admittedly, asking this question is itself a little awkward for us. We are, in some ways rightly, used to letting the great river of habit lead us along. If your answer to why regarding the church or faith or any such things is, well, that's just what I do. That's who I am. Well, that is truly a beautiful response in many ways. It is my response as well in many ways. But playing a five-year-old, I want to ask you again, why? Why is it just what you do? Why is it just who you are? One of our key priorities here at Union Church is to help people grow in personal, curious, generous, and socially engaged Christian faith. It's that first word, personal, that we're trying to talk about here. We don't force you to talk about it very much, maybe not even as much as we should, to be honest. But yeah, hopefully, in some way, this is personal for you. We don't tend to talk about people accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior because as those words are usually used and understood today, that personal implies an individualism that is alien to our perspective on the faith. But we still want this to be personal. We hope you will own your own faith, take responsibility for it, treasure it. What's your why? In some ways, this question grows out of our work with our church partners in Angola. In our society, and in others like it, Life is dominated by the future. We think about where we are going, what we can accomplish, how to make things better in the future. Our view of life is like we are driving in a car on the highway. We look out through the windshield in front of us at what's ahead, we look at what the future holds and how we're going to get there. But I discovered in Angola, reflecting a broader traditional African view, worldview, that the image of the driver on the highway works very differently. They don't see life as looking ahead through the windshield as you go down the highway, but rather they see life as looking in the rearview mirror at the past, at what has gone before. By seeing where they have been, who has gone before, what gifts they have received, what twists and turns they have already overcome, that's what propels them forward. In that sense, the past is not the past, but it lies there now in the present, in the rearview mirror, to be seen and treasured, but also examined, honored, but also analyzed. Now, I feel like this difference of perspective is part of why our church partners in Angola have such an easier time with knowing their own why with faith being personal for them. 
Now, over the next few weeks, you'll hear from staff and church members, because this is not just about the pros. You'll hear from staff and church members about their why. To be clear, we are not putting ourselves on a pedestal. Sorry if this disappoints any of you, but your staff members, myself included, are not paragons of faith or faithfulness. Oh, actually, I forgot to ask them ahead of time. Um, Rob, paragon of faith or faithfulness? Most certainly and certainly not. Allie? Uh, 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 Stephen, you're talking, right? Probably not. Grant? Not even close. Not even close. Yeah, no. And I'm sure that the members... Um, who will be talking, all of whom, I think, when we asked them to do this, said, uh, why me? I think they have no special claims to spiritual brilliance either. But in this series, what we will have is some intentionality. We will all have taken some time to consider our why. We're taking some time to consider what the core is, what the essential is, what is it that lies in the rear view mirror but is with us now, that has made us the people of faith that we are today, whatever that faith is like. We want these talks over the next few weeks to be real because it's only in being real that they will be helpful to any of you. We're not asking for orthodoxy or piety, just honesty, because that's the only thing that will really help you in this time in which we live consider what's your why. So now, on week one, I get to go. What's Mike's why? I am a Christian because there are a lot of ways in which this world, everything from my heart to global systems of power, there are a lot of ways in which the world is messed up. There are a lot of ways in which this world is alienated from its true self, in which we are alienated from our true selves. And I am persuaded to believe that the way of Jesus is the best shot we have to being led home. But the precocious five-year-old will ask rightly, why? Why are you persuaded that the way of Jesus is the best shot we have to be led home? That's fair. On one level, I acknowledge being thus persuaded is a matter of luck, or really probably better of inexplicable grace. I am here today. I have committed myself to this personally and professionally years ago because for whatever reason, the worship of my childhood worked as intended. When I was little, most Sundays, I sat in the pew with my parents and brother and sister at a very ordinary and very boring Lutheran church. I fidgeted around and made noise and bothered my parents and all the rest. But while all of that was happening, without even knowing it, I was listening and looking and absorbing. What I heard and saw and absorbed was a vision of a different world, 
a different way in the world. In the hymns, I heard about love. In the confession, I heard about forgiveness. In the scripture readings, I heard about a guy who taught that mercy triumphs over judgment. In sermons, to which I wasn't actively listening, unlike all of you here today, of course, in which I wasn't actively listening, but which I somehow heard anyway, I absorbed that I was part of a people who longed for something different, something a better way. And that kind of worship both shaped my view of everything. And as I got older, it opened pathways to digging deeper into the way, into what the way of Jesus is all about. As I can describe it now, a few years after my childhood, one of the key features of the faith into which I was formed was that Christianity was always pretty countercultural. The way of Jesus that I heard about in my childhood, my youth, was not aligned with the powers that be or with the American story or even with other Christians who already when I was a kid were using Christianity to defend the indefensible like war and racism. For all of its pretty package, a Bible literally with gold-lined pages a glimmering cross like we have here, 300-year-old hymns that we sang, I still heard the countercultural call of Jesus, and I loved it. And now, a fair number of years down the road, I am still grieved that the world is messed up from here to there. And I am still persuaded to believe that the way of Jesus, the way of grace, the way of mercy, the way of truth, the way of accountability with compassion, the way of love, even love that leads to death and resurrection that is even the way of the cross, I am still persuaded to believe that if the church can embody that counter-cultural vision for the world lived out by Jesus and handed on through the ages, then we just might, all of us, all of this alienated, beautiful world, we just might, all of us, be led home. That's my why. What's your why? In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.